Good morning. Today, I'll preach the second sermon of the Lord's Prayer Trilogy. Let's read the scripture text. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Pray then in this way, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, pray with me. Father, as I preach this morning, may you give all the hearers your spirit of discernment. Discern for what is your word and what is just my opinion. And for your word that is preached, may it stay in the hearts, our hearts. May, it, may your words take roots and transform our lives. This we ask in your son's name. Amen. Let's begin by looking at the occasion of Jesus teaching the prayer. In Luke Gospel, we read, Now when Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he stopped, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. The situation for Jesus teaching the prayer is record, as recorded in Luke and Matthew could either be two different occasions on the same day or two different days. We observe that Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer is shorter than Matthew's. Jesus could have taught the shorter version first to the disciple who asked him, and then he, rep he repeated the prayer. He taught the prayer in Matthew to steer the, the people and the disciples away from praying like pagans, that is, chanting meaningless repetition. Now, it is customary for a rabbi to teach their disciples to pray. We observe John the Baptist did that. A rabbi's teaching of the Torah is called a yoke. In Matthew 11, Jesus said, My yoke is easy, my burden is light, which means that Jesus' teaching concerning approaching God is easy and light when compared to the yoke of the Pharisees and other rabbis. Now you might wonder, is it necessary for Jesus to teach the disciple to pray? You see, the Jewish people already had the Psalms, and there are many prayers in the Psalms that the people could use as liturgy for praying. However, unlike today's Christians who have at least one Bible at home, the Jewish people did not own any personal copy of the scripture, not even the Psalms. Scripture copies were kept in the synagogues and in the temple. And even if the people had a copy of the Psalms, many of them could not read Hebrew, that is the sacred language for worship. Yet on the other hand, the people also had a collection of prayer compiled by the rabbis, this collection is known as the tefillah. It is still used in the synagogue today. The tefillah contains 18 prayers, and today they added one more, 19. So if they already had the tefillah, why did Jesus still teach his prayer? The tefillah and the Lord's prayer have some overlapping contents. Jesus, in his prayer. He simplified many of, many of the petitions in the tefillah and tuned those petitions to be in line with the Father's will. Now, for example, concerning restoration, the tenth prayer in the tefillah asks God to gather the exiles. The eighth prayer asks God for healing the wounds of the people. And then the 14th prayer, return the people to Jerusalem, build up 
Jerusalem. Now, as for Jesus, he taught the disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come. On the issue of vindication, the people ask God to look upon their afflictions, cut off all their enemies. But Jesus taught the disciples to pray, Thy will be done. The Tefillah called God to attack the people's enemy, fight for them. But Jesus' prayer stresses God's will be done, implying, let God vindicate you, make things right for you. Now concerning provision, the people ask God to bless this year and all it's you. And Jesus simply taught the disciple one line, give us this day our daily bread. The Tefila also has a prayer on forgiveness, forgive us. But Jesus added in one more thing, forgive us as we forgive others. So you see, Jesus made his prayer short, memorable, and apparently he tuned all the petitions of the Tefila to be in accord, in harmony with the Father's will. Now let's look at the Lord's Prayer and our praying. Firstly, the Lord's Prayer is not a prayer template. It's not meant to be a set pattern for praying. You see, Jesus himself did not use the prayer as a format. In John 17, his, he was praying during the Passion Week. Right away, Jesus prayed for the Father to restore his glory he prayed for the disciples to be sanctified. He prayed for the future believers to know the Father's love. Now, the Apostle Paul himself did not follow the Lord's Prayer, use the Lord's Prayer as a format also. He just prayed whatever they are needful for the churches. For example, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 to 4. Paul prayed, Blessed is the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, God of all comfort who comfort us in all our troubles. So just pray right away what's on his heart. Now we come to the Apostle Peter. Peter uttered the shortest prayer when he was drowning. Lord, save me. And Jesus did not say, sorry, Pete, you must start with our Father who art in heaven. Now try again. Now we can't imagine Peter mumbled, our Father, and he disappeared. Peter just yelled, Lord, save me. So you see, the Lord's prayer is not to, meant to be a template or a, a set pattern for prayer. Secondly, we can observe that the Lord's prayer is remarkably short. Many Christians assume that a long prayer equals a good prayer, and a short prayer is an immature prayer. But you see, the, the, the prayer that Jesus taught is short. It is concise, but yet the content is hefty. So we see a short prayer can be a good prayer and it can be a mature prayer. Then thirdly, we see that in the Lord's Prayer, there's no call for a fixed time to pray. The Jewish people pray three times a day, at sunrise, in the afternoon, and finally at sundown. But Jesus did not stipulate any special hours for daily prayer. Apparently, Jesus desired his followers to go beyond the routine of praying three times a day. The Apostle Paul exhorted us to pray unceasingly in 1 Thessalonians 5. He told the Thessalonian Christians, pray without ceasing. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? Praying unceasingly should be, a, should be as natural as the way we breathe. We breathe continually even when we are asleep. When we are sleeping, we don't stop breathing. We continue breathing. As prayer is a communion with God, so whether we are awake or asleep, this communion with God continues. This fellowship with God continues. Only thing we may not be conscious of God's presence. 
Now, fourthly, the Lord's Prayer is a guide for unhurried communion with God. It is a guide for spending unhurried time talking to God in His presence. In Psalms 139, we are, we are taught that we are always on God's mind, in God's thoughts, and God is thinking of us at all times. And David testified in Psalms 139, verse 2 to 3, You know when I sit, up, sit down and I rise up. You know my thoughts when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. Then in verse 4 we read, You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. Jesus also tells us, Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So for this reason, our prayer should not always be coming before God, presenting Him with a long list of shopping items. God might say, Oh, give me a break. I already knew what you wanted. Just spend time with me, okay? Let's pause to reflect. Now, do I think of God when I sit up or rise up? Do I think of God when I travel or rest at home? Do I think of God before I'm going to say something? Am I conscious that God goes before me and follows me? Am I conscious that His presence is always with me? Let's grow to be conscious of God's presence so that we may talk to God without ceasing. Now, fifth, the Lord's Prayer is a precept to enjoy God's presence. When we meditate on the Lord's Prayer, we are sensitized to God's presence with us. Many church fathers wondered how Jesus prayed. Although the prayer Jesus taught is short, the Lord habitually spent hours in praying. He rise up early to pray. Occasionally, he'll pray through the night. And church fathers like Isaac the Syrian in the 7th century, Isaac believed that Jesus spent long moments in silent communication with God. In that silence, Jesus prayed without words. You see, when you are conscious of the Father's presence and the Father being with you is searching your hearts and mind, no word is needed in that communion. That moment becomes a spirit-filled time. Now today, many Jews, after reciting the Shema, the, the Shema is the Jewish confession. Hear, Israel, the Lord your God is one. After this confession, they will spend some time in standing silence before God. And after that, they'll begin praying the Tefillah. May we learn to be quiet and still when we come before God. So let's learn to spend time with God unhurriedly. Now let's look at the first three petitions of the prayer. First petition, hallowed be thy name. To pray hallowed be thy name is like saying, may the fire become hot when the fire is already hot. So how could we pray for God's name to be holy when God is already holy? Isn't that petition unnecessary? Since there's no way for us to make God more holy than He already is. Not so. This petition has twofold. First, hallowed be thy name is the work only God can accomplish. No human can make God's name holy. Only God Himself can make His name holy. But this petition reminds us that we are coming before the presence of a holy God. 
let's recall Isaiah's response to God in, in his vision, Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah stood before the majestic holy God, he cried, Woe is me, I deserve to die because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's army. Now, Isaiah's predicament was likened to a high priest who accidentally stepped into the holy and of holies. If any person, should any person stumble into the holy of holy, he would be struck dead because of God's holiness. In Isaiah's case, Isaiah did not die. Instead, God sanctified Isaiah. We read that an angel picked a piece of burning coal and touched his lip and then proclaim, your sins are taken away. So when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we will not sanctify God. Instead, God sanctifies us. The Apostle John talked about sanctification in 1 John 1, 9. We, we read just now, if we confess our sin, God is gracious to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And that is the sanctification we, we would experience when we come before God confessing our sin. The second fold of hallowed be thy name is that although we cannot make God's name holy, we can profane God's name. We can defile God's name by the way we live. In Ezekiel 36, we learn that Israel's sins and exile caused God's holy name to be defiled in the eyes of the people of other nations. The Gentiles thought that God was too weak to protect Israel. So God told Ezekiel 36 in verse 20, And wherever my people went among the nation, they profaned my name. The people of the nation said, These are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave their land. And in the same way, our unchristian behavior, conduct can profane God's holy name. Injustice is a common issue in the workplace. And if we as Christians did not uphold justice, instead we practice some injustices, people will say, might say, you see, the God he worship has no justice. And in that way, we profane God's name. So when you pray, hallowed be thy name, we are also praying for ourselves. Father, don't let me profane your name. The second petition, thy kingdom come. Some theologians asserted that the kingdom of God has come. The kingdom is here now. Some anticipate that the kingdom of God is still future. The kingdom is yet to come. So what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God has three features. Firstly, it has a king. Every theologian agrees. Second, the kingdom has a domain. Every theologian also agrees, but they dispute over the nature of the domain, whether the, the domain is, will be a physical domain or a spiritual realm. But the kingdom must have the reign of God. The reign of God must be present. Actual reign, not merely ceremonial. God must reign. In Old Testament time, Israel was a physical kingdom. The land was a domain intended for God to reign in and through Israel. But God's reign was absent most of the time, absent in the king's hearts, absent in the people's life. Israel king was supposed to represent God. They are supposed to rule as God's representative. Unfortunately, after King Solomon's reign, all the rulers in Israel and Judah, except for eight kings in Judah, they worship pagan gods. The kings and the people indulge in idolatry. 
So the, king, the kingdom of God in Israel degenerated into an earthly political kingdom. Now in New Testament times, God exalted the resurrected Jesus as king. The Lord Jesus reigns in the hearts of all believers and we are his people. But the domain of the kingdom is yet to be established. Some theologians equate the church with the kingdom of God. They say the church is the kingdom of God. But when we look around us, many nations and people have yet to acknowledge Jesus as Savior and accept Jesus as King. Worse still, they reject Jesus. But only when Christ returns, then every knee in heaven, on earth, and under the earth shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. So from this perspective, we see that the kingdom of God is here. It is here in the present. But the kingdom is yet to be fully realized. The fiscal domain is yet to be established. Now God does not want us to fight for his kingdom. He just called us to pray. Thy kingdom come. The third petition, thy will be done. This petition focus, focuses, uh, direct us to live in conformity with God's will. What is the will of God? Jesus did not leave his disciples clueless about what God's will is. The Gospel of Matthew records Jesus' teaching on God's will in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, firstly, God's will concerns our being, and this is expressed in Jesus' teaching of the Beatitude. The eight Beatitudes are teachings for character growth. The first, be humble before God, that is, being poor in spirit. And when God says, you are wrong, we don't say to God, no, I'm right, you are wrong. And be remorseful for the wrong you do. Blessed are those who mourn, for they are comforted. That is, being remorseful. Then be humble before fellow men. That is, to be meek. Be hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Be merciful. Be pure in heart. Be peacemakers. Be steadfast when you are persecuted for righteousness, when you are persecuted for doing right. So the it be beatitude expresses God's will for our being. Secondly, God's will concerns our right living. This aspect of God's will is expressed in Jesus' ethics. The technical term for Jesus' ethic is called the six antithesis. Each antithesis begins with the clauses you have heard it said long ago. And Jesus said, but I say to you, against the traditional belief. So the first ethics is about, do not murder, even with your words. Don't say raka to your brother. Second ethics, don't commit adultery, even in your heart. Third ethics, stay faithful in your marriage. Don't be quick to divorce. You will name it your spouse an adultery, adulterous. Then keep your words. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Don't swear unnecessarily. Then don't retaliate when humiliated. When you're slapped on the right cheek, turn the other cheek. And the last ethics, love your enemies. You see, God is concerned about our inward disposition. He wants our inner being to match with our outer deeds. And this consistency is what is Jesus called perfection. And he said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. To be perfect does not mean to be a moral perfectionist. It means to be whole. That our inward being matches our outward deeds. 
Thirdly, God's will concerns our doing His word. Jesus wants us to do right in God's sight and not in the eyes of men, just for show. And He wants us to be doers of His word. He concluded the Sermon on the Mount with a parable about a wise man who built his house on the rock. Jesus taught, Therefore, everyone who hears the word of mine and put them into practice. This word of mine refers, in Matthew Gospel, it refers to Jesus' teaching of the Sermon of the Mount. So, if you put this word of mine into practice, you are like a wise man who built his house on the rock. God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. When we practice, when we observe what Jesus taught us. The fourth petition, provide us the bread we need. I'll continue with this petition next week, but now is the introduction. In the fourth petition, we will pray for our daily bread. After teaching the disciple to pray, give us this day our daily bread, Jesus assured his disciple that they have a father who cares for them. You see, many people in Jesus' time could not relate to God as the Father in heaven. They felt unworthy to pray to God because they saw themselves as sinners. And they are always and repeatedly been told by the religious leader, God does not listen to sinners, the prayer of sinners. And they knew, Psalm 66 verse 18 said, If I regard sins in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So they had no confidence to pray. Now, Jesus encouraged them, the people and the disciples especially, now you have a heavenly Father who cares for you. He cares especially for the sinners. Look at the birds in the sky. Look at the lilies in the field. You see, your heavenly Father cares for them. Aren't you more valuable than they are? If our Heavenly Father cares for the birds and the lilies, how much more will He care for you? So let's be confident in praying. Give us this day our daily bread. After this teaching, Jesus exhorted the people, above all, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Then all these things, the basic necessity that other people seek and you are also seeking, this thing shall be added to you. In conclusion, let us recap the key points of the sermon. Firstly, Jesus' teaching to pray is a yoke that is light and easy. The Lord's prayer is a guide for unhurried time with God. It is a precept to enjoy God's presence. The first petition, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be God's name is the work of God. And we are praying in this petition, God, don't let me profane your name. And when we confess our sins, God sanctifies us. The second petition, thy kingdom come. The kingdom of God has come and is yet to be fully realized in future. We don't need to fight for God's kingdom to come. We are called to pray, let your kingdom come. The third petition, thy will be done. God's will concerns our being. God's will concerns our right living. God's will concerns our doing his word. And in the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, 19, God's will is for all peoples to know him and worship him. The fourth petition provides us the bread we need. We dare to ask because God is our Heavenly Father. We are confident to ask because our Heavenly Father cares for us. This lady composer Sally Default summarized Jesus' teaching about the birds and the lilies in a song she composed for her granddaughter entitled, I Know My Father Loves Me. And we will sing this song as I Know My Father Loves Me as a response to the message. The worship team shall lead us now.